All right, thanks all for coming tonight. Um, this will be really entertaining and really interesting. So how many of you uh, have already met Brian today in various capacities? I have. Yes, excellent, excellent. So it'll be a continuation of some of the fabulous stuff that we saw earlier today. And um, I'm gonna leave, uh, Brian and I wanna leave some time later for Q&A. So for those of you, um, how many of you have not met Brian but are familiar with his work, have at least seen it? Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. There you go. That's a lot of people. So we want to reserve some time at the end for questions because there's a lot, right? Brian's work is very varied. So, um, so I'm going to do a formal introduction, and then you can take it away. So I want to thank the Arts Department and our interim chair, Jeffrey Hauck, for supporting the event this evening. And I would like to introduce the visiting artist, Brian Lewis Saunders. So I followed Brian's work uh, for years, actually going on about 15 years at this point. And initially I was drawn to his experimental practices and unapologetic mindset. And as you will see this evening, his methodological approach assumes a unique and varied position defying categorization. He has been called an outsider, a performer, a poet, a stand-up tragedy artist, a traveler, a rebel, and an innovator. And since 1995, Brian has worked to excavate the varied nature of his creative process, a task documented in his daily self-portraits. I think you said today number is about 11,000, over 11,000 self-portraits, and which uh, capture his daily moods, affects, and observations. Over the years, Brian has been homeless, widely exhibited, uh, incarcerated, institutionalized, celebrated, marginalized, and obsessively interviewed. He's inherently interdisciplinary and has traveled the world, experimenting with a diverse array of media forms, styles, and audiences. He has created numerous physical and psychological contexts, including under the influence of dreams, drugs, sex, torture, and wanderlust. In 2003, Brian traveled to China to become the first stand-up comic in the country. And he trained in Mandarin for nine months prior to his departure, spending six hours a day self-learning the language. However, upon arrival, Brian was faced with an absent stand-up comedy scene and returned to the US to begin his stand-up tragedy performance series. <coughs> a practice in which he sought to perfect the art of making strangers cry in public. You have retired from that, though. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, today, Brian maintains his self-portraits, um, complemented by performance and uh, exhibitions in the US, Spain, France, Austria, Israel, and a plethora of other countries. He currently lives and works in Johnson City in Tennessee and attended East uh, Tennessee State University. And reviews and critical inquiries of his work have appeared in Vice, CNN, Hyperallergic, Wired, the Huffington Post several times. And he was also the subject of a 2014 documentary titled Art of Darkness, the provocative investigation of his life and work. It's available on Amazon Prime. Students, you have it free. So uh, he's performed with Lid uh, Lid Lydia Lunch, Eugene S. Robinson, and B.B. Hansen at the International Poetry Festival. He's also exhibited alongside Basquiat, Damien Hirst, Henry Mouchot, and Vitkasi as part of the Sue and Fluence Artiste Aid Psychotropes at uh, La Maison Rue, uh, Rogue in Paris, France, and was part of a 2015 exhibition titled De Macbury Mons at the Dollhouse Museum in the Netherlands, an exhibit that featured his work alongside Van Gogh. Uh, most recently, he spent 30 days in self-initiated blindness and deafness for a performance titled Blind and Deaf Months at the Bunk Spot in Cincinnati, Ohio. So, without further ado, Brian Lewis. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Jenna, for having me. Um, this is my first time ever doing this type of uh, event, so I hope I don't get nervous and start clicking too much. And <laughs> if you see the screen behind me, just like raise your hand or something, if it's like going super fast. All right, let's see. So on March 30th of um, 1995, I started drawing at least one self-portrait every day for the rest of my life. And um, I do them all in these uh, like eight and a half by 11 and a half inch sketchbooks. And right now I'm on book 131 and um, number 11, I'm over 11,600. But I also put this uh, picture up here of my art journals. It's where I, it's like an art diary, like writing. I put this up here because even though there's not as many books as there are sketchbooks, this art journal is incredibly important uh, to me because it's where a lot of um, my ideas and stuff get hashed out. And um, I recently, last year, 
read all through them again. And uh, it was really incredible. Uh, I recently moved, and they all fit in one load in my car, but just barely. If I move again, they're, they're probably not going to fit anymore. And uh, my girlfriend said I should take this picture so you can see how they are in my living room. <laughs> I keep them on the shelf facing backwards because it's like this way to view my life as it's like progressing over time. And so I can like look at it and I know where the, um, like right here, this is when I was living in the dorm. Here's, right here's where I was in China. Here's where I, my new apartment now. And then also I can look at the books and see like, oh, when I first started, they were all in black and white. I was like afraid to use color. I started when I was in art school, a bachelor's degree, a drawing major. And then um, the next group, I think after my eighth book, I, I got the nerve and I started doing color. And then eventually I started doing experiments. And I used to be able to, um, I used to be able, like someone would say, oh, remember that time we went to the waterfalls? And I could just walk to my bookshelf and pull out, like, boom, that book, open it up and find it. But now, because there's so many of them, I totally have lost it. I'm, uh, it'll take me, like, several books going back and forth one way in time. But there's still little clues uh, that I can find, like this one right here. There's a fork sticking out. This one's shorter. This one's in a plastic bag. And so I know like this one with the fork, that's like 2000. And um, all my life I'd heard people say, don't put things in the electrical outlet. Don't stick forks in the toaster. Don't stick forks in the outlet. And then in June of uh, this year, I said, hell with it. And I stuck this fork in the electric outlet and it like started, it like burned and went poof, like this and started burning. <laughs> but all of these, I was trying to think of a way to tell y'all like an overall idea of what this means to me in my life. And pretty much it's like this big long journey from numbness to hypersensitivity, trying to be as most sensitive as possible. And in the beginning, I was really like, I had a lot of a, a lack of affect because when I was a child, like a really small child, I don't know if I was ever diagnosed uh, as being a psychopath or a sociopath, but I know uh, uh, if, if I was, they didn't tell me, but I know I had uh, anti-personality disorder and uh, post-traumatic stress and stuff. And when I was a little baby, not a baby, but like maybe five or six or something, I would leave my toys right there so that when my mom woke up in the morning, she might fall down and break her neck. And she would say, Brian, stop leaving toys on the stairs. She didn't know I was to this day unless she watches this video. She doesn't know I did this on purpose. And then <laughs> when I got a little older, I was like a bully, like the older kid. There's more older kids in my neighborhood and they would always pick on me. So then I started picking on people. And so then I would like, more than one occasion, I packed rocks in mud and I would start mud fights with the kids and crack their heads open. And then the parents would never let their children play with me. And then by the time I was 15, I shot a girl in the right leg at the bus stop. And then three days after my 21st birthday, I ended up in DC's prison. I was from DC, Northern Virginia area. And um, prison was extremely harrowing. I don't regret it going at all. Uh, it was a life experience, but I saw like sexual assault and uh, one murder, a lot of violence and stuff. And um, one time on April 25th, 1990, I almost had to kill somebody, really, really kill somebody because they stole this picture of my girlfriend. And then someone almost killed me, wanted to kill me, really bad, like seriously kill me dead over one of these pencil erasers. And um, my grandmother sent me a whole pack of pencil erasers in the mail. And if I ha hadn't gotten that and given this guy one, he was, he was 17 years old. And they, he was one of this group of kids called the Super Youngins. And um, he was locked down in his cell, was never allowed out because he'd stabbed one of the guards. Well, he let me borrow a pencil. And then it had one of these erasers on it. Well, I let someone else borrow the pencil. And when they gave me the pencil back, it didn't have the eraser on it. 
Well, I went to give him the racer. This guy lost his fucking mind. And every time he saw me, he threatened to kill me. He was going to kill me. And I, I, I wasn't too worried because he was like always locked in his cell. But then after I gave him the uh, erasers that my grandmother sent me, they, like a week or two later, they uh, searched his cell. And inside of this Slim Jim container, he had three homemade knives and he had a machete that he'd made out of a trash can lid. And I, I was so glad my grandmother was there for me. I, I can't tell you, it was really something. But prison also helped me to get my GED because I never graduated from high school. And I scored uh, high enough on my GED that I got accepted at East Tennessee State uh, University. Well, this is how I used to draw, right, when I first started drawing class. And this here was 20 minutes, and I was like really shy. Not put any pressure at all. I tried to be like super perfect in everything. And then like once we started trying to learn values and stuff, I was drawing like this, but then my teacher came over and was like, no, draw this guy like this. And she just like scribbled this. And so then we had to go outside in uh, one class and draw this amphitheater. And it had like some columns and some bushes. And I was just getting so frustrated because the other students, some of them had private lessons for eight years. They could draw totally perfect. And uh, I wanted to be a good drawer and everything. And, uh, but it was just kind of hard and I just was so timid, I guess is the word. Well, I just one, one day we were drawing this amphitheater and I just got really angry, and I started cussing these bushes, like stupid fucking bush, hate bushes, draw bushes, like this, and then the teacher came over, and she's like, wow, I love the way you're drawing those bushes. Come here, class, and she had the whole class come around behind me, and I was just cussing the bushes the whole time. <laughs> it was like really wild. Well, then the next class, we had to do a still life, and I was like, stupid still life, I hate still life. So I was just cussing the still life. But then over time, I did, it got to where eventually I didn't have to be angry anymore to draw. But I had this, <laughs> I had this belief that practice makes perfect, even more than I, way more than I believed in myself. I believe that if I just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, I'll get skill. And eventually, I'll be good as, as good as I want to be. And so I, I don't know if my parents or my grandparents who instilled this into me, but this idea of just practice makes perfect was enough for me to keep, not give, not ever give up or anything. But in the beginning, I didn't have a lot of feelings. And uh, the only two feelings I really had were boredom and anger. And I didn't want to be angry at other people. I didn't want to ever go back to prison again. And so a lot of times, you can see, I would like take the anger out on myself and stuff. But then also, like you hear sometimes people have negative self-talk where they just like say things, like bad negative things to themselves. Well, I would negative self-draw. And so I would like make myself weird and like deformed and everything. And um, once I started becoming aware of this over time, uh, I got to where I could advance past that. And one thing I learned by drawing myself every single day, I wanted to try to organize my life. And, and I realized that the brain is not a computer, it's not a machine, it's an organ. And the sole purpose for the spinal cord in the brain is to organize things in the world. Like if something in your environment is moving or it's getting bigger or it's get, getting smaller or like feelings you have, uh, it, it, the brain, it, the whole purpose of the brain is just to organize your world. I, I really believe that. And, and one of the ways that I've come to take note of it in my art journals, not in my sketchbooks, is over time the meanings of drawing myself every day has naturally changed. And every now and then, like every few years or so, five years or something, I notice I'm saying something different when I'm describing to people what it is that I'm doing. And in the beginning, I wanted to make an encyclopedia of myself. And uh, I remember when I was a little kid, I used to love looking in Encyclopedia Britannica books at all the different pictures, learning about the world and stuff. Well, I wanted to have this encyclopedia of myself that when I die, I have like every feeling, every thought, every belief, every behavior, everything in one big work of art. And people would say like, oh, that's a good one. Oh, you did a good one today. Oh, that one's great. And I'd be like, no, it's not about that one. That, it's, it's about all of them together doing it every day until I die. It's all one work of art. And then 
pretty soon on I noticed that no two pictures were ever the same. I was always being influenced by other stuff, even if I didn't know what it was that was influencing me. Like one time I bought a book, like a used book, and then I did my picture for that day. And it was like a real weird color palette. And I was like, that's a strange, I never did it with these colors before. And then when I moved the papers off of my desk, that brand new book cover had these same, same red and yellow and black colors and stuff. And so we're like constantly being influenced by things in our environment, even if we aren't aware of it. But then my family and all my friends and everybody would tell me like, but Brian, you're only drawing yourself. You're boxing yourself in. You've got to get out of yourself. You've got to draw other things in life. And, to, and I would say, no, to me, the way I see it is all this time, like for hundreds of years, artists have been putting something of themselves now into pictures of the outside world, like doing the landscape this is the way they see the world. This is the way they see the landscape. This is the way they see the figure and stuff. But to me, I felt like it's not just one way limiting myself of only seeing the world one way because I'm constantly being influenced. If I go up on a cliff, that's going to put an impression upon me and like influence me and stuff like that. So I was saying, no, I'm putting representations of the outside world into me, which I feel is more worth it. But then also at the same time, I started feeling more and more uh, like I was helping myself mentally, like mental health. And so I thought, oh, this can be a way to, for me to grow my feelings. I'm like a lot of times they would say like, well, once you have this type of psych psych psyche, like psychology or a personality. It's like really hard, like you're stuck with this personality and stuff. And I just never believed that. And I've just always been trying to like you grow my feelings and grow as a person. And so that's why when those other pictures where I was um, these, I, all the things that I did to other people, there was a period in time in 99 where I just started doing all these things to myself. It wasn't that healthy, but I was trying to empathize with the people. So then the multi-tool, this was one of the last, one of the more recent meanings for drawing myself every day. And I really feel like drawing, like purposeful mark making and music, purposeful sound making, are the two most basic, primal, primitive human instincts. Like, these are the things that make us human. And uh, to use them as a, a tool, I can't tell you how incredible the act of drawing is to me as a practical, pragmatic, utilitarian tool. Like making a pot, something like this. This to me is how drawing is too. So in the beginning, I was doing uh, th like daily therapy, anxiety purging. Well, there'd be times where I'd just start feeling tense inside. And so I would get my sketchbook out and just kind of get rid of it. And so this, I picked this one to kind of show you how I would draw this way. Like, I would start from sensations in my body. So here I'm like tapping my foot. I've got my legs crossed really tight. My stomach is sitting kind of heavy and it's grumbling a little bit. I've got this kind of pressure in my chest. I'm really stiff and I've got this nervous energy. I'm not really thinking too much. My eyes are just kind of like glazed over. But I would do this, just get rid of, by exerting the energy that it takes to make this drawing, I would just purge myself of this feeling. So then when I went out driving or something, I wouldn't get road rage or something because I didn't have this type of pent up anxiety in me. And uh, here I bought a queen size bed for the first time ever in my life. And I'm poor, so it was like a big purchase. And so then it's just my daily way. Oh, I made a big purchase. I get rid of this anxiety. And this one, I was having a plast, like a bust made of my head. My head was totally closed up except for my nostrils. And so I was just drawing myself, just dealing with this type of claustrophobia or something. Another thing I was experimenting with for a couple years, because sometimes I would get panic attacks, was trying to figure out a way to use drawing to kill the panic attack. And what this is, is 13 different drawings that I did, they were all only about like this size, like really small, 
right when I started having a panic attack. But the drawing doesn't stop the physiological effects of having a panic attack. Um, as soon as I get uh, some panic, I start breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth, and I start smiling to change my facial expression, to change my feelings and stuff. But the act of drawing slows the panic attack down enough that I can get in there. And once I start, I'll show you, this is how I did it, okay? I, I started panicking, so I thought, no, I want to be calm and happy. So I started drawing, but then as soon as like the angst started going up into my head, I started a new picture. Then I started doing that. I was listening to the sounds. I was, oh yeah, I need to start breathing. So I listened to the sounds of my breathing. I started feeling lightheaded, but then as soon as the anxiety started like creeping up again, boom, started another picture. And then I started, I was like, oh, I need to smile and try to make myself be happy. But then the smile started turning into this grimace, boom, started again. This whole thing was only with the, this maybe three minutes long. But by the end of it, you can see I like totally killed that panic attack. Not with drawing, but with interacting with my feelings in real time as I was experiencing them. And it's, it's, like, it's like a new lease on life. Now, dealing with childhood traumas. When I was six years old, I was at Ocean City, Maryland. I wanted to surprise my grandmother. And so I went looking for seashells on the beach and I found a dead lady. I thought she was a shark and um, totally like shocked me. And there'd be times in life where someone would say Ocean City, Maryland, or maybe I would like smell the beach in the morning or something and all of a sudden I'd be like paralyzed. Like, oh, that time I found that dead lady and everything. But because I, I didn't plan this, but because I did this picture about it, I started using it in performances and becoming more familiar with it. Like right now I have it in this PowerPoint and so I'm seeing it again. Because I did that, now whenever these triggers happen, instead of going back to being six years old and all of a sudden my body like tensing up and my breathing stopping, my brain goes to this picture. And it's like, I don't, I don't know why, I don't know if it's because I made this picture from the third person perspective or if it's because I made myself like a cartoon perspective. I'm not sure what it is about it or if it's just the familiarity of this image. But then I tried it again with another image of a car accident I saw and it was like the same thing. Now it's like the triggers aren't triggered because they go back to the images that I made instead of like these like freeze frame like gifts or whatever like psychological gifts that just go over. But now this is a different one. When I was 10 one of my mom's sisters had a miscarriage on our toilet. And it, I never saw it. I saw some things, but my imagination of what was going on was way more traumatizing. And so when I thought, well, I'm going to try a different way of dealing with it. So I drew myself as the miscarriage in the toilet, but I tried to make it almost like spiritual and peaceful and stuff. And, and now I, I have to try really hard to like think back and try to put myself back into that uh, traumatic place. And um, it, it's just been, it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, then exposure therapy. <coughs> now sometimes I would notice in life that, oh, I'm afraid of heights, or like I see some video of kids like taking photographs on like a tower or something really high up in like Malaysia, and I'm just like, oh my God. And so then, but once I realize that I'm afraid of something, I'll get my sketchbook and then go and do that thing, and then draw myself while I'm experiencing it. And I kind of feel it's like maybe war, war journalists, the way they kind of remove themselves from the horrors of war because they're looking through a viewfinder and the sketchbook kind of has this same kind of distancing power too. So here I am on a ledge on an 11-story building holding on to some type of like lights and drawing myself. This one, a rattles this was in the wild, a rattlesnake was rattling and coming right at me while I was drawing it. And uh, I wanted it to bite my book, but I was so afraid that the um, 
They sensed the heat. I was afraid it would know exactly where my thumb was. And so I never did, like, I didn't mess with it. I didn't tease it or anything like that. But when I saw it, and everybody's like, oh my gosh, there's a rattlesnake. I was like, oh, here we go. Uh oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like that the whole time. And it was like, <laughs> um, this one, I had a uh, fear. There was this crack growing in this building I was living in on the outside. And then every now and then I think, oh my God, this building's gonna collapse. Or whenever I'd hear on the news about earthquake or something, I think the building's gonna collapse. Well, I went on the other side where I thought the, on the other side of where the crack was in the stairwell and then drew myself like facing my fear of the building collapsing. Diary journal. This is uh, most people when they think about my daily self portraits, they think of them as like, well, you've got like this really big diary and everything. It, it's partly like that, but also I don't, not so much illustrative, but I picked some that were. This one is like real. Um, I was eating blackberries in the wild, and this is real blackberry juice, and I got it spread and put it on there. This day I made pot brownies. And I was the Pillsbury Doughboy throwing like marijuana confetti into it. <laughs> and you can see I used the, the a butter knife to spread the brown paint on like it was chocolate. And then this is me in Fuzhou. I went to a disco. I was like, if I go to China, I've got to go to a Chinese disco. And so I was like, there's me going to the disco. I don't know. Some, I never learned how to read Chinese, so somebody wrote on my book when they saw my picture at the disco and they, I don't know what it says. 